here, and um, and we've attracted a lot of new industry. Just in the first six months of the fiscal year, our numbers are up 16%. And, uh, and also, since we met last year, 12 million additional square feet, that's 12 million additional square feet of distri distribution centers have, er have either been built, uh, come online, or planned. So um, that's the brief update, and I just, I'm just i happy to be here, and thanks for having us. Sure. Um, I would like to. Uh, I could, uh, we have two projects that we want to complete this year. Um, the, of course, the Container Birth 8 project, which you all have put funding in for the past three years. We, we have gotten to the very end of, of that project. It's a $109 million project. Um, this year, um, <clears throat> we have a request in the big budget uh, for, for general obligation bonds um, that, will, that will finish it off. It's, uh, it's a request of, um, of 19... Uh, what's the number here? Um, let me see. I, I was prepared and then I wasn't prepared. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. $19.1 million, that's correct. And um, that will finish up the funding for Container Birth 8. We expect to bring the first phase of that online next month. And so containers will be coming in and out of Georgia as a result of the great work here um, uh, starting next month. The, the second project that we also want to finish off this year is um, the deepening project in um, Brunswick. That deepening project, uh, we're, we're requesting uh, in the governor's budget $3.2 million in general obligation bonds. Um, when complete, 100% of the vessels now calling uh, uh, all ports across the country um, that, that are dealing with uh, roll-on, roll-off cargo will um, will be able to call on that port, and that will that will really move us forward and advance uh, opportunity, economic opportunities, and jobs for Georgia. So those are the two requests. They've finished off two major projects, and we'll be back when. Um, when, when you're ready to talk about that budget. That'll be in a couple weeks. So okay. I'm glad to have you, so have a safe trip home. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, forestry, I think, is here. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I, I take it you'd like for me to address only the 06 amended, correct? correct? Okay. Uh, what I have is a uh, tracking sheet has about, uh, I guess, six items on it. Uh, the first one is workers' compensation uh, premium difference, which I think you've probably already seen a number of times. Uh, fairly straightforward. It's an increase to reflect those uh, the increase in premiums. Uh, the second one is realigning funds from uh, management and protection and, and uh, seedling, nursery, and tree improvement programs, which are the four programs that we have, and it's moving funds among those. Uh, and that recommendation, I think, out of OPB was uh, to approve those, those changes. Uh, the next one is uh, for $131,000 is for 15 additional firefighter positions. Uh, these are not new positions. It's simply funding to fill existing positions. Uh, we had in 2004 about 530 people in protection. Uh, this last year uh, we've had about 488, a pretty s a substantial reduction, and it's actually been going down for about 10 years. We don't need to fill all those positions. Uh, we're finding ways to be a lot more efficient than we were. Uh, we need to fill about 15 of them. And so what that 131 is, is a uh, one quarter of the year funding for 15 positions. That's what that amounts to. Uh, item number four is uh, funding for ongoing and deferred maintenance uh, for firefighting equipment. The 876-222 is a partial funding of the total amount of uh, maintenance we've identified. We went through and looked at all of our equipment uh, identified exactly what needed to be done in terms of maintenance to get uh, the equipment up to standard across the entire agency, and it came up to something north of twice that number. Uh, but we can't do it all in one year. 
And so we're not going to pretend to. Uh, this 876 is a partial funding of, of that amount. Uh, the next item is uh, on number five, I think, on the list is for uh, commission-wide upgrades to communications equipment. Uh, you may or may not be aware the Forestry Commission has a, uh, a, a statewide communications capability with repeater towers. We have radios on all of our equipment, both for safety as well as control purposes during, during the course of fires. Uh, it's not the 800 megahertz system that the state has been trying to develop simply because the 800 megahertz system does not work. It doesn't, uh, those frequencies won't get into the woods. It won't penetrate the, the leaves and into the woods, so it doesn't work for us. Uh, so we're having to maintain uh, a separate system. Uh, we have gone a number of years without spending any real money on maintenance, uh, and uh, that's what this 500,000 is for. Uh, lastly, there are 18 pieces of equipment, uh, actually substantially more than that, but we've got 18 we've identified that we want to replace this year that have over 135,000 miles. And that's what the, uh, the last amount is for, is for the replacement of those vehicles. We're still doing that. We're actually building our own offices now, so. making a, uh, a real effort to prioritize our needs and uh, we've actually found a few ways to save even some more money but uh, we've ended up redirecting that back to some of the priorities we've identified and uh, uh, we're, uh, we're trying our best. Thank you for your comments. Uh, that's that's the uh, minimum I feel like I can for for this year. Uh, our standard is uh, varies depending on the type of equipment, but for this type of uh, vehicle, we feel that once we get to that type of mileage, uh, that it's just not reliable enough to be you know ready to go all the time. finish out 06. That's correct. And we have a, a targeted list that's larger than that as we go into 07. Uh, no, they're not all abandoned. We have three that we're actually operating on an as-needed basis. Uh, the people that were uh, regularly up in all the towers around the state, uh, we've replaced that with, uh, you know, with an aerial detection system. But we have three locations where we do have people that regularly go into, into fire towers. That's the that's ninety five percent of the purpose of that equipment. That's correct. It's used for other for management purposes, but you know if if we didn't have the protection role, then we we would really wouldn't need that type of equipment. We have uh, uh, we have a number of our towers for sale. There's a reversionary interest on the land under most of those towers. And it, you may find it interesting that we have sold several of the towers three times. Uh, once we sell them, 
we didn't get paid. <laughs> Once we sell them, they find out that uh, it's too expensive to take them down. And so it's a little bit of an albatross for us, and we have some of our maintenance money, frankly, going just to keep them up and safe. I, I just, I just uh, wanted you to know I was one of those purchased one of those towers several years ago, <laughs> 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 and it it did take me a while to get it moved several years. Uh, I was about to decide I was going to have to buy the land it was on to get any benefit, but I had a friend of mine in construction help me move it. But uh, I just wanted you to know they make uh, great deer stands. Oh, I bet. <laughs> You didn't leave it at the original height, I take it. About half. Okay. <laughs> I can get about to see all over my farm with that. I bet. I bet. That's maybe the average, uh, but they range in price from about uh, seventy nine thousand dollars to uh, twenty four thousand dollars. So it's quite a range in the vehicle price. Like equipment trucks. Some of them are equipment they trucks. Cars with lights on. They no, have, uh, no, not, no, no. No. These are trucks that have, even if it's a three-quarter ton pickup truck, it's got a water tank that we fabricate in our shop uh, as a first response vehicle. So these are firefighting pieces of equipment. So does this cost go towards that fabrication? Uh, no, we do the fabrication separate. You know, these are just, the cost of the that's right. We cover that, you know, through another. We've got a fabrication shop there on site, and uh, basically the cost, of course, is for labor and the, uh, and the materials. Uh, oh, doing the fabrication? I'm sorry, state your question again. Yeah, everything is bid, that's great. Is that everybody? Okay, thank you. Can thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Bill Miller, Director of Administrative Services for the Georgia World Congress Center Authority. I want to bring apologies from our Executive Director, Dan Graveline. He had a scheduling conflict today, and since we didn't have anything in the FY06 supplemental, I told him I thought Representative Rogers would excuse him from being here. But I'm glad to be here with you today, and if there is anything that uh, – You'd like to ask me about our operations or our budget for F we do have something in the FY07 budget. We're excited about that, but I can always address that at the appropriate time. Any questions for Bill? Thank you, sir. Okay, we have a special guest here from the Hurdy Foundation and uh, I'm gonna let them come up and introduce themselves and uh, give us a brief, brief discussion on what they do and how they do it, and uh, we're glad to have you all. I think you're from Savannah, too. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members, my name is Yatsak Siri. I am an economist and a professor with the University of Georgia. Uh, one year ago, the governor called upon me to serve on the Board of Trustees of the Hertie Foundation, and uh, I'm very happy and proud to do it because Hertie has a major potential to add to Georgia's economy. Uh, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to tell you about what Hertie is doing and how it is evolving. And with this, I would like to introduce Dr. Bill Brandich. Dr. Brandich comes to us from Kentucky, where he served as commissioner for the new economy, and a very successful one. He came to Savannah, Georgia, to retire and we have been very lucky to persuade him to postpone his retirement and work with us for the Heritage Foundation for the State of Georgia. Dr. Brandich. Thank you. Yeah, I think thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity. 
The Hurdy Foundation was created in 1938 in honor of Dr. Charles Hurdy, who was a professor at the University of Georgia, and he's the father of the paper industry in the southeast. Uh, he probably had a greater impact on the economy in Georgia and in the southeast than any other individual has. The, uh, the purpose for the Hurdy Foundation, it was created, it's a state-owned corporation, it is economic development. They started out working in the pulp and paper world, helping uh, uh, that industry and develop new products. It's, uh, it's a, more of a development than a research organization. We have equipment uh, we call paper technology, paper processing technology, where we can do the development uh, for a company. Uh, whereby they don't have to uh, build a building, hire the people, or buy the equipment. We have all that for them and add a great deal of value and cut much of the cost in the development or finding out whether or not they can manufacture uh, their new technology. But over the last few decades, uh, Hurdy hasn't been doing a lot of paperwork uh, with the pulp and paper industry. It's been mostly with companies that are applying other materials to that particular technology. So as we look at the global competition and what's happening in, in manufacturing in this country, uh, we determined, the previous board did, the heard is to have me do a business plan for them, and we created a transition and growth plan for Hurdy that would expand its capabilities not only in the forest products world but in manufacturing in general and advanced materials. Most manufacturers, if they're developing new product lines, are going to be doing it in the advanced materials world. Uh, and that's getting uh, a manufacturing. I've been to, God, I don't know how many meetings the last five years across the country. And a lot of people are scared, and there are some, some good reasons for being concerned about our manufacturing industry. Uh, we've, we've all read about Ford, certainly, and General Motors are right behind them. Uh, but today, if you're in manufacturing, if your product becomes a commodity, it's going overseas in all probability. You're going to have a hard time staying in business. The only way to stay in business or to save our industry in the United States is through innovation. We've got to continuously innovate, enhance existing products, or come up with new products and technology. And that's what we're up to at Hurdy. We've strategically partnered with Georgia Tech, Savannah Art, uh, College of Art and Design, the industrial design people. Uh, we'll be working with the University of Georgia and eventually with the Medical College. And we have a number of companies here in Georgia we're working with. But uh, innovation today is not as it used to be. Uh, it was much simpler, uh, more involved in, our, in engineering. Today it's design, architecture, and engineering. It's combining the right brain with the left brain, and that helps us identify new applications for a company's technologies, and new markets uh, that they might never have thought of before. So we're building that capability uh, at Hurdy now. And we've, uh, on top of that, we've worked with quite a few of our companies in the state and across the world to identify what it is they really need uh, to help them to innovate, in particular our manufacturers. And we call it a gap, and, and, and it is those facilities, equipment, and people that cover the range of design, architecture, and engineering. Not only shows them how to manufacture something and make sure that it is economical to do that, but to help them to find markets and, and add uh, new technologies to the technologies that, uh, that they have. The organizations like Hurdy, and I've, I've done this in Florida and Kansas, uh, Kansas City uh, and Kentucky. They, they are state owned by the state, and their purpose is economic development. And if they can't have a significant impact on the state's economy, they really shouldn't exist. And I took a long, hard look at Hurdy, and I've never seen an organization quite like this at any state level. And I, I never created one like this. Uh, you're allowed to really get in bed uh, with the manufacturer. And those states that are going to be most successful in this new economy, and in the last 25 years, a number of states have spent billions of dollars building this economy. The most successful are those who blur the lines between government, academia, and uh, the business community. We have to assume some of the risk with our manufacturers and help them uh, along the way. And those states doing that are, are they've proven that it can be done and it does 
work. Uh, and not, we started in the early 80s doing this, and we set up a lot of programs, venture capital programs, entrepreneurial programs, seed capital, uh, institutions, uh, and, and a number of uh, technological areas, uh, industry areas. But we've gotten to the point now where we know how to build industry clusters. And that's where the big payoff is in economic development, when you can build an industry cluster. Uh, a good example is the wine industry in California. You have the wine growers, the, the wineries, you have transportation, finance, uh, uh, workforce, all the things that go with it. Uh, automobile industry with their suppliers would be another one. But uh, we, I, I believe, I firmly believe, with our strategic partners, we in Georgia can build an industry cluster in advanced materials that almost all of our manufacturers can take advantage of. And within five years, Hurdy ought to have a, a highly significant impact on the economy of the state of Georgia. Moreover, it ought to be able to generate enough revenue by assuming risk with these companies to have a pretty good royalty stream at that time. And, and all the companies we've talked to, all the way to some big, big ones that you know of, have agreed to talk to us about that. Uh, we passed out our request for the fiscal year 207 budget, which gives a summary of the budget and, and details about that. We believe with some, uh, we are doing pretty well. We're starting to pick up a good bit of business. We've got Fortune 100 company now and others. I have my COO is in Europe right now talking to a, a firm there that uh, is considering us to do some of their development and moving their manufacturing to the state of Georgia. Uh, we have a great deal going going on, and uh, I, again, I believe that uh, with some state funding, uh, we're going after some federal funds as well, and uh, with the money we can generate by helping our manufacturers in the state, the the, uh, the Hurdy Foundation can be can very be very successful. But again, with its strategic partners, and in closing. Uh, I mentioned that Hurdy got started in the, the pulp and paper world helping forest products, and the, that industry, of, we all know, has been not doing well, uh, too well in the last couple of decades, last few years. Uh, we have been looking for a niche in the, the forest products world that we, we can play a major role in, and we've met with a number of industries and a national organization in forest products. Uh, last week, we determined that we are going to build a capability in the nanotech world, an application of nanotechnology to the paper uh, the forest products industry. And we think we can do the most good in helping that industry out by adopting that technology capability. If you all have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. We appreciate this opportunity to talk to you. No, that's not the full budget. We, yeah, we will leverage that. I need to know what the full budget is and how private funds are matching or doubling yeah. what we're showing here to keep the, the foundation going. Because foundations uh, imply you know, some public grants, however, mostly private funds for research and development of new right. projects. Yeah, I worked to, with OPB. We, have a, a, we did a, a five-year budget. And yeah, I, I will make that available to you. Now this is this is only a fraction of what we're going to need to do what we're doing. Well, I'd I'd, I'd like to initially, uh, we would like to come close uh, the first year to a one-to-one -one match, and then uh, over the years we would uh, we would increase that. Anybody else? Yes, Ed. What number are you? Seventeen. We have 38 at this time. What percentage of the, in the operations of 333,000, what percentage of that is overhead? Uh, well, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, with us, most of it is in the plant. Who I'd have to look at that. It ought to be about 10, 15 percent in that area. But I'm, I'm going to have to look at that because we, we mix uh, the overhead, uh, part of the administrators are working the plant as well. So it's not, not all of us aren't 100 percent overhead, 100 uh, percent administration rather. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, you. You want three million four hundred thousand dollars? Correct. How, how much do you want next year? Uh, that's for two thousand seven. Okay. How much you want for two thousand eight? Uh, it will be close to that amount again the next year, and then it would decrease after that. And I'm trying to. Is this going to be a continuation item? Yeah, the pro, we, Herdy would need some help for the next five years, but they wouldn't need this amount of money every year. Mr. Chairman, if I may make a statement, I, I just like nothing against it, but I, I'd like something that shows a little bit more detail within the budget mm -hmm. uh, for that kind of long. We'll send you a five, give you five, the five-year budget. I had met with them several times, but the, okay. uh, they wanted to do a presentation. That right. I thought now would be the good time to do it. Thank you, Mr. I don't think they've gotten any state funding. Not since 1999. Any other questions? Mr. Timber and and that kind of thing. My question is, uh, or a request is, if you could bring us in some concrete, uh, definite numbers of what you think you'll be able to match what you're asking us to do, I think that would help us in justifying, you you know, in our own minds, what we can do as far as the state money is concerned. Okay. Yes, and I, and I have that, and I will uh, when I get back in the office, I'll I'll send that to you. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you for being here, and we'll start the 2007 in a couple of weeks. So. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, we're honored today to have the uh, DOT commissioner here, Mr. Harold Leninko. This is the first time we've had his presence here in two years, right, Commissioner? Uh, I believe that's right, Mr. Chairman. We're honored you're here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, as, I'm, as I understand it, uh, y'all got it turned down. I do now. All right. <laughs> thought I was in my office. Uh, now, as I understand it, I believe our deputy commissioner met with you folks earlier this week. I was in Washington and unable to be here, and I heard that y'all were meeting again. You might have some questions, so... Uh, uh, I came back from Washington to see if there's anything else that uh, that might be on y'all's mind that that I might be able to answer. Uh, we do have the deputies here with me today as, as they are a treasurer also. Anybody have any questions? Contracts. Okay. Uh, Earl brought me a copy of them today, and I think that's the – I'm handing them out right now, Commissioner – I didn't hand mine out. Here they are, right here. Uh, I guess you have a copy out in front of you. Yes, sir, I do. I'm going to let everybody get a copy of them. Um, I think I asked you this question in the big uh, hearing we had last week. Uh, Department of Law Litigation Services for Construction Claims, $900,000. Is that one claim or is that ten claims? And if so, were the cases won or lost, or do we know? Well, as far as telling you if they won or lost, I'd like to say we won them all, but that is not one claim. Uh, we pay uh, the Department of Law. They're our attorneys on all of our right-of-way cases, which we do have condemnation cases. We've got cases that do go to court. We've got uh, other litigation cases that, uh, that our folks also try when there's a, uh, an incident on the road. Somebody may leave the road. We get, uh, we get sued for that. So we do contract with the uh, Department of Law to be our attorney in those cases. We also have cases, though, with uh, contractors where there are some issues that, uh, uh, that we can't settle through our contracting process that do go to law, uh, go to a court case. So, uh, so all of that is involved in our payments to the uh, to the Department of Law. Now, according to the law, is they bill you once they finish the case? Isn't that correct? Mm, I don't know if it's is it is it afterwards. Some of the billing is uh, 
side done on a monthly basis, not after we've done because it's ongoing litigation, so uh, it's uh, done on a reimbursement, the attorneys. Uh, Earl, you need to come up here and speak on the mic because we're on. I want you to hear this. On the web. Glad to have you. A lot of our litigation uh, in our billing from the law office, you know, we have ongoing activities and it's done on a reimbursement basis. So as a result, the, the invoicing is submitted by the attorneys in uh, detail down to, you know, little uh, stubs for uh, making uh, trips if they, they have to go out of town. So all that's done on reimbursement is submitted to the law office and then they give us a, an invoice, but it's not always done on a uh, completed basis. It could be done throughout the uh, term of uh, the litigation for each and every one project. That 900 is a specific contract for them to hire attorneys to assist us in all of our litigation in, in uh, construction claims. The Department of Law? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. And then they sub it out if they need to, correct? As appropriate, yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Any questions anybody else have on that? Next item I had was uh, the Ventry Engineering Thank Commissioner. You. Value Engineering Studies and Reports, U.S. Costs, Lewis and Zimmerman, GFP Consultant Services, Acquire Expertise and Skill for Engineering, engineering Services. And there's a consultant down there for $750,097. Yes, Acquire Expertise and Skill for Engineering Services. Yeah, yes. Vent, like Venture Engineering. Yes, sir. From Venture Engineering, U.S. Calls, Lewis and Zimmerman, those value engineering studies. Yes, sir. What do they do? What do you, you mean as far as what these studies yeah, are for? Right. Oh, I'm not sure what the studies are for. Do That's federal law. Okay. The uh, federal highway or the bill through Congress requires any project that's above $25 million, we have to do a value engineering to think, to, to check and make sure that the way we're doing the project is the correct way of doing it, or is the, the most uh, economical way of doing the project. Okay. So we, if we have, or I shouldn't say we, when the DOT does a set of plans or engineers, you know, the civil engineering, and they are a licensed engineer, we have to come back and make sure they're qualified or what? Well, when we get, you're talking about when they, the, in the early, early stages of contracting? Correct. Correct. No, in the early stages of contracting, we contract out our consultant work for the design activities, if that's what you're talking right. about. Right. All of that is put out for bid. These contractors or these consultants have to be pre-qualified in order to submit a request for qualifications. They have to they have to turn in or, or they have to submit that they are qualified. They have to prove okay. that they're qualified. So these folks do this for you all? Oh, correct? yes. Okay. Well, no, this right here is looking at when we get through with everything, we want to make sure that, that the process, the way we're doing the project is the – is the most economical way of doing the project. It may be staging the project. It may be the type construction projects or, or uh, concrete versus asphalt, you know, materials. Gotcha. It's a different way of doing things, yes. Okay. And uh, MTG coordinators, program coordinators in district offices. I know there are, how many district offices? We have seven. We have seven district offices. And, and what do they do? What is that? For? What does the districts do? MTG. I'm trying that? to look at that. Program coordinators and district office. Right. I'm not sure what MTG coordinators. What four hundred fifteen thousand dollars? Is it four fifteen or is it twenty five? I can't see with my glasses. Yes, yeah, four fifteen. That's the uh, transit coordinators, where we have rural right. transit and. Right. Uh, Somewhere around 86 to 90 of our counties, we have a transit program. We provide them the uh, the uh, buses, the vans for that. Right. We have That's like the Red Rabbit up in Hall County. Is that right, Todd? Okay. Gotcha. Yeah, we got a Red Rabbit. Let's see. Could be the Red Chicken. 
Okay. Consultant research, acquire expertise and skill not available in the Department for Research and Studies, $4.8 million. Yes, sir. We have consultants that help us out. I don't want to say that, uh, that we don't have the uh, availability to do this work in-house other than the fact of uh, we don't have the enough people to do our work, the research work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And in just about every one of our offices, we have consultants on board to help out in each of these areas. It may be asphalt uh, research. It may be in uh, environment location activities. It may be any of the activities within the department. But we hire con consultants to help out and supplement our workforce. Okay. Brown Protection Services, security for the TMC building. Yes, sir. TMC building is the uh, is the uh, our traffic management center that is over on Confederate Avenue, uh, in conjunction with GEMA. That is, uh, we do have to have security out there. That is a secured location. You would think that it's secured through the uh, National Guard, but uh, we also have security that we provide to get into the facility itself, just like these buildings. Okay. U URS, ITS, Operations and Support Project? Yes, sir. Yes. You are, ITS is our intelligent uh, transportation systems. That is the, uh, uh, the cameras you see on the road, the changeable message signs, mm -hmm. the uh, things such as this. That is the, and URS is a consulting firm that is uh, very knowledgeable in that field, and they help us in developing the hardware, the software, how we're going to, what are we going to do on the next phases of uh, developing ITS components. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, Representative Forrester. If the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services and the consultant below it are doing the this, this same thing, combined it's uh, $4.7 million because it says ecology services for the consultant and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services and Environmental Review Services. We have, we have contracts with the consultant that's helping out over in our environment location office to move our environmental process through. We also help support... Uh, staff members at the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife and some other regulatory agencies. So our projects, when they get to them for project review, where we have to have permits to move our projects, they are they move our projects up to the front of the line, and they do those. They are working with these regulatory agencies, though. These two do not do the same thing. Okay. Is that consultant? That's one consultant. Well, it's a consulting firm. That may be several consulting oh. firms. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Venture Engineering, U.S. Cost, Lewis and Zimmerman, they're all doing exactly the same thing. They do the same operations, yes, sir. They're they not working on the same project. They just do the same thing. But the, totally, uh, you know, you over five million dollars there you, you just prefer not to let one of the vendors do it the uh, it's not not a case of whether we want one to do it or not a lot of our contracts are put out a contract say in March a contract in July a contract in October and they all bid the same thing they will bid on that yes I, I just thought the dollar amounts being the same to three different companies well we're typically that sure looks strange well it's it's the same type work what's Oh, they didn't do the work? No, no, no. The, the dollar amount that you see is just the budgeted amount. What they actually be when they actually be in an award, the contract or the, the agreement, the dollar amount may be different from what you see budgeted. The budget is just an estimate of what these contractors may receive. All right. May I continue, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, Acquire expertise and skill not available in the Department of Research. Now, is that an estimate of how much help you're going to need? That's the consultant research, $4.8 million. But is that an estimate? Yes. Are all of these estimates? Yes, this is the budgeted amount. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have you done an in-house study on how much you could actually hire the people to do that for? 
we uh, we can go back in house and, and on the contracts that we have already put out, and we can tell you what those are. But as far as an in-house study, we've done a study to say it should cost us this much. That's how we develop our budget to get the work done, and that's based on previous uh, contracts of the same type work. But that's how we set our budget up. We may not need the full 4.8 million. Yeah, earlier to the chairman's questioning, you said we have some people that we just don't have them on staff to be able to do this. For, for what you anticipate to be 4.8 million dollars my question is can you hire someone to be able to do what you, your anticipated needs are for less than 4.8 million uh, we have uh, we have not gone there and because we can't get the staff numbers we can't get our our, our you know, personal services raised up to, at, with positions to do what you're talking about. We're limited on how many people we can hire. We've got to go out and get our consultants. So it's, it's not a question of whether we, uh, uh, you know, whether we can do it cheaper or not. We don't have the positions to do it. Uh, if, if we represent a rural county that uh, would like to get one of these um, Red Rabbit, I believe he called it, buses uh, to get our people around, uh, what's the procedure we go through to request that? There's a uh, 5311 program. That is the transit program. It's administered through our Office of Intermodal Programming. And, uh, and and probably you already have that, but they work with the RDCs down there, and uh, we can certainly get you the whatever information you need as far as to get signed up for that. But uh, we do have somewhere in the neighborhood of 85 to 90, uh, the last check, we have between 85 and 90 counties that are taking advantage of that now. Thank you. The other thing um, is under this item of high-speed rail study, uh, I know at one time, uh, we, a few years back, we had a strong push to get a, a train line down to Macon and then eventually to Savannah or Jessup down that way, or Albany. Uh, that has sort of slowed back down in the last year or two. We hadn't had the emphasis uh, on that uh, rail project. But I wondered if you could just uh, briefly uh, give us an idea of the outcome of this high rail study and uh, where we stand on getting uh, rail transportation between Atlanta and Macon. Okay. Two different things you're talking about there. The high-speed study is not the same as the inner-city study right. that's going down to Macon and then further on down to that. Jessup or Albany down right. that way. It's two uh, different questions, it, really. It is. The, uh, where we're at on that, that particular study is finished. We started it oh, probably 10, 12 years ago. It identified routes. And now we're looking into the implementation of that. The first leg of that is the one that you've heard about going down toward Macon, but stopping at Lovejoy because that's all the money we've got right now. Mm -hmm. The uh, high-speed rail is one that's coming out of Washington. It's coming down through Charlotte, coming down through Atlanta, and heading on down into New Orleans. The, uh, there's some funds set up in Washington to, to set up to do a study, and we've got to put money in there to match that study. All federal dollars have to be matched. And uh, that is right now... That program or that high-speed rail is coming to Charlotte. Now, all we need to do is cross the little state of South Carolina, that tip of that, and get it into Atlanta. We need to get that on down in here, and that's what this study is for, is to get it all the way down through North Carolina, South Carolina, and into Georgia. We are ready on our side, and we're asking for funds, we're budgeting funds, to fund the re that study part in Georgia. Now, I can't address the study part that's in South Carolina or the part that is North Carolina. They're going to have to put their money in to match those federal dollars in their part of the state. But uh, that study is to determine... Do we? Is it feasible to run high-speed rail from Washington all the way through Atlanta, uh, through Charlotte, through Atlanta, and on down to New Orleans? And how will that compare to, to Amtrak that we currently have? Uh, it, it is a higher, high, well, as it is, higher speed. The, the speeds of these routes will get up somewhere in the neighborhood of 79. I don't believe they'll reach in the 105 range, but that is the high speed range in there. The Amtrak doesn't do that. Now, there is an Amtrak line that does come down. Matter of fact, there's one that comes down through the uh, Jessup area down into Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. 
but uh, it is uh, it's different in that it is a, a higher quality, faster route. Any other questions? Commissioner, the question and the comment on, I notice Goodwill Industry is a vendor for training women in construction. Yes, sir. Uh, nothing against women at all. But is that is that a program set up to bring women in the workforce? Or it, it does. It brings women into the workforce. It also gives them training. Uh, it is something we have been involved in for several years now. It's a very good program, um, but it does. It brings women into the workforce and in, in really brings them into skill areas that they're really just not accustomed to. Some of your uh, uh, more of a mechanical skill type thing, you know, operators of heavy equipment on the roadway, things like this. Now, that's where we use them. Now, that goodwill industry trains them for other activities also. Okay. It's just so for our benefit, we get them into skill areas that you really, they're just not quite accustomed to. You, you're not accustomed to seeing them. Uh, I know it's probably an equal opportunity, but as far as the male population, do they uh, you have trouble getting folks for this job, or is this something that men normally are not adept at? I mean can do other things besides what these are trained for? Well, that's a real good question. The, the issue with us, though, we do have high turnover if we're talking about, say, that area where we're talking about uh, uh, um, you know, truck driver type or equipment operator type. We have high, high uh, turnover in those areas because with our salaries, even with our benefits that we have in the state, county governments, contractors, they're, uh, you know, we get a little bit of training. On, they get the training under the belt with us, and they will jump over in a heartbeat. And, and those equipment operators is our biggest loss, is biggest turnover we have. A comment is about uh, Representative Reiner is talking about the consultant cost and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you recall we came down with our local governments, and I asked you the question, maybe they were hiring outside consultants to do work on a local level, and I asked maybe a DOT could furnish some of that, and you told me at that time, you know, y'all were covered up. I mean, you, you'd love to do it, but you just didn't have the manpower to do it for local government That's as it. well as some of this other We've stuff. got the expertise. We just don't have enough people to do it all. And we're consulting out right now. We're consulting out about 55% of our work. We just do not. I mean, even construction inspection is consulted out in each of our seven districts. Oh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, I had two questions. One, on the... Um, contracts list where it shows consultant is there a reason we don't have the name of who the consultant is well as a budgetary all it's just a budget item okay. where so we'll we put in we're going to hire a, a consultant in here some of these uh, uh some of these folks are consultants when you look up there at the fourth and the fifth line down uh the sixth line down those are individual consultants okay. but for the most part they are it's a budgetary item for the broad field of consultant to do a certain thing. I understand. Thank you. And then the, the county contract is about a little further halfway down, airport planning. Do you know which airport that is or is that just? <laughs> that, is, uh, that is all, all 102, well, there's 103 publicly owned. 102 of them are included in our operations, and we do the uh, uh, some planning activities. We work with local governments on this. Some RDCs get involved in this, but that's all of the 102 Hartsfield is taken is that, out of that. Is the number do you see it to be 30,000? Am I reading that? Wrong? I think a, if I can read across, I think you're correct. 30,000. That is correct. 30,000. All right. Thank you very much. Well, now, this is not planning. Uh, are you planning an extension on a particular runway, and it's going to be so many feet, so wide, and things like that? This is the planning study to determine needs at these airports. Yeah. 102. The only public airport is Hartsfield-Jackson. We do not have money go through through us. You, Representative Barr? Yes, sir. Sort of. Brought from uh, Representative Scheid's comment or question, the contractors that are listed, is this contracts we already have in place that we're paying them into 2007, or do we just assume they're going to win so many contracts from us 
uh, the example with the, the value engineering studies, venture engineering, U.S. costs, and Lewis Zimmerman, do we assume that they're just going to win this much, or is this payment into 2007 for contracts they, they have? No, I couldn't answer that. Uh, Earl, you've got that. Earl, you're going to come, have to up come here. back up here. <laughs> Just stay up there, Earl. What it boils down to is uh, some of these are continuing type contracts, and, and we know after we've actually done a, uh, a procurement, in other words, we do a solicitation, RFP, and we'll make a selection, and then they'll come to the budget office and they'll ask for uh, funding of it because those are things that are mandated that we don't have a choice doing. Some of the ones that say consultant to do some of these activities to supplement our workforce and all, I'll just grab one easy where it says pedestrian design guide training. You know, we're putting together this type of uh, a pedestrian guide, and before they would go and do that solicitation, they're going to make sure that it's going to be funded by the budget office. So when you see consultant out there, they have not done the RFP or the uh, – procurement process, they're asking, is there money to do it first? And if it is, then they'll go ahead and go through the procurement process. So we show just consultant. If it's a mandated deal and, and it's, or it's a continuation, we'll end up uh, doing the uh, process. And then before they can make an award, they'll go ahead and get budget approval. And that's why you'll see individual names on some of the other ones. But it is more of a budget tracking document, uh, but it combines both uh, – forward moving projects as well as projects that have gone through the procurement process and we're waiting to do an award based on uh, budget approval. So the ones that have consultants listed, there's been an award or there's been a contract won and you're just waiting to award for contract. It'll be for that approved. amount uh, and there's, the budget's already said that we're going to go ahead and set up this much money for this contract to uh, the city of Brunswick and as an example or Glynn County or uh, any of the U.S. Coast Guard or something. Or Kissinger, Campo. Or Kissinger or, or any of those people. It's right. like the, you know that they've already won the bid. Right. Sometimes. But now we've got to fund it through the budget. Right. Because we've gone through the process because it's, it's not an optional activity. Some of these activities we're going to go ahead and do because it's continuation work. So we're going to go ahead and go ahead and do a contract, find out what the amount is, and then go ahead and uh, – what do you call it, make a, a budget commitment, encumber those dollars directly to that contract, and then make the award once the uh, budget has been approved. So this is not an estimation? Not all of them are estimations, no. But again, th these are maximum contracts amount. In that sense, they're an estimate, but these are really contract amounts for the most part. If it's a blank amount and it's a consultant, uh, and we have not done the uh, procurement, the RFP out there, it may be an estimate at that point. Okay, but well, let me uh, strike quick to the chase here. So if there was there was need for money, say, in the Department of Agriculture for their new vehicles, and I look here and I see, hey, $4.8 million for a consultant, would there, be a, would, would there be a problem with a contract you already have for me to say, I need to take $100,000 out of this 4.8 to be able to fund my Commissioner of Agriculture's uh, <laughs> purchase of some vehicles. Yeah, because Big problem. Big problem. It's not motor fuel tax. Motor fuel tax can be used for roads and bridges and the, the uh, uh, items to support roads and bridges. So nothing the Department of contracts. Agriculture cannot use a dime of motor fuel tax, not the way the law is in Georgia. So you can't, you can't pull motor fuel tax to put it into another agency like you're talking about. That would be the problem. Okay. So, but there wouldn't be a problem saying, well, 4.8 is too much, maybe just 4 million. And then that 800,000 not going anywhere. But let me explain on one thing on that research to be clear on it. There's a large component, there's two components of uh, research money. We get planning and research and and true research. This money is usually ran through the uh, Georgia Tech Res Research Institute. I'm not saying all of it is going there. And what we do is we contract with them to do a, a lot of research that is done at the uh, college, the graduate, and doctoral level where 
that are doing a lot of studies uh, that we would not hire PhDs and other people from the academic community to do this type of research as pure research people at the DOT. Where we actually do a, applied engineering where they do the actual research stuff. So that's an amount that we would do lots of contracts and a lot of special research projects for them uh, w with the uh, Georgia Tech Research Institute for the most part. But it, it encompasses two things. And, and again, at that point, this is a combination of different sources of dollars. It's not always, you know, like some of it where we saw the aviation. That could be general fund dollars because, again, we can't use motor fuel on it. Less than a half of 1% of our total budget is, motor, is uh, general fund appropriated. The rest, rest of it is motor fuel or federal dollars. So some of this is also federal dollars that's being pushed through this system in contracts. That's what we were asked to get. But some of these are federal dollars and not even motor fuel dollars. Okay, so wouldn't it be best to show this committee what funds are general funds and what funds are federal dollars and what funds are motor fuel tax? Otherwise, you're showing me a budget request and you're saying I can't change it. Well, I think uh, just to be clear, we weren't trying to do a budget request. We were asked to supply this information, and we can sort it any way the, uh, the committee would like us to do that, but we were just asked to get up uh, our contracts that fit in the uh, contract uh, class in the line item for contracts, okay. and that's all we were doing. That, that we're not asking sense. for really a request because yes, this money is already appropriate. Right. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay. Anybody? Ed? I'm sorry. I, I mean, I'm learning, and I appreciate your patience with me so much. <clears throat> I am concerned, however, that uh, on the question of the consultants, now, I, I didn't pull out the Palm Pilot and do the math, but this is $43 million, and the quick running off the top of my head to the 14 things that talk about consultants is worth about $17, $18 million. And, and there's, there's a, the, I'm looking for that good old American checks and balances. What happens, I mean, are, you know, if the consultant comes in and says, you know what, last year we did it for $5 million, this year we got to do it for six because their own business isn't perhaps as good as it was a year ago. And you're telling me that, golly, we just we just can't get in there and, and, and hire it for ourselves. And I, and I don't understand the reasons why we can't. But I'm wondering if we're doing enough self-examination to make sure that we're getting the most bang out of our buck in, in those hirings for those consultants. If you let you'd me, like to be able to pay more roads. If you let me address that. Sure. Uh, when, when we do these type of uh, contracts, uh, before we would just go ahead and uh, issue a contract, we go through a procurement process. And usually since they're consultants' activities, and some are vendor and they supply us and it could be a fixed rate, but most all these things would be done through a cost proposal uh, type of arrangement. And what we would do is once we shortlist a group of consultants before we would make an award after doing the RFP, we would then ask the, what do you call it, uh, preferred consultant to give us what we call a cost proposal. The cost proposal outlines the reasonableness of them doing the work. Whether or not they have all these other reasons that would increase it really doesn't mean a whole bunch to us. They have to have a CPA audited overhead rate. We don't just say that they've got additional costs because they moved into a new building or they've got new additional phone calls or phone equipment. No, it's a CPA audited overhead that complies with the uh, FAR, the Federal Acquisition Regulations of the federal government, whether it's state or federal, because we think it's more stringent. Once we look at the cost proposal, then we'll look at is there a reasonableness of the right number of staff, and then at that point we go back and we negotiate where we think that it is unreasonable or unacceptable. And if they have something that cannot be, what do you call it, uh, qualified, you know, under the federal regulations, that's not allowable expense, we would reject that. You so expect. all of our projects and contracts go through that process, both engineering and non-engineering activities. Yes, yeah, so you do expect the consultant to make a profit. Yes, and that's part of, and that's allowable under the federal guidance. And, and when I read, because we don't have skill in-house, I'm wondering is if we went out and tried to find that skill, and maybe we have. 
uh, but a, a constant review, would we be able to keep some of that profit in-house to be able to do more for the citizens of Georgia? Thank you. And I, and I think the commissioner was right, if you don't mind me make that comment. A lot of it is driven as much by not having the positions and being able to fulfill those technical expertise. And you are right that we, if, we, if we did have those people, we could keep the profit. However, attracting and retaining those people at those salary levels is so competitive because some of these things in, in the ecology area and a couple of these other areas are so special niche areas that uh, we just can't attract them and, and, and even hire them to begin with, not, no less retain them. So it's, it's a, a battle that we're continually working on. And, you know, we have a, a staff that evaluates positions for that one reason because it's, it's tough to get these special niche uh, technology jobs. I think what we do is not uncharacteristic of a lot of other DOTs. There has been a move in the last decade or so toward outsourcing to consultants because that's where the, the expertise is, is residing. You know, people come in and they get their basic training from Georgia DOT or from Tennessee or some other DOT, and as soon as they get enough basics, they end up uh, opting to uh, move into uh, the consulting world because they'll pay a higher premium. Florida is about 90 percent. Yes. Uh, Commissioner, did you have your light on? Okay. Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I guess I've kind of looked at it in the way of, you know, I see a lot of consultants on there, but um, I think the Department of DOT should go out and let the private sector come in and do the consulting because that frees our department up to do the management and looking after the projects and, and make sure the designs are done. And we just had a design build bill last year that lets private industry come in. And then we had PPI last year. So personally, it doesn't bother me too much to see consultant on there uh, as long as we're keeping a watchful eye and knowing that we're getting the bang for the buck, I guess you'd say. So um, that's all I'd like. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Yes, Representative. Go ahead. Mr. Frank, I appreciate you guys being here, and this has nothing to do with your budget, but I understand from the Assistant Commissioner, Chairman Smith, myself, and the Speaker will be excited here. We have two flex lanes going in, 985 and 16875, or is it a flux lane since so you took part of the auxiliary lane as well? But I just want to tell you, we appreciate you being open minded. And well, well, I think it's going to work very well. On this issue of, of consultants, there's one thing I want to get clear in my own mind. I believe you said that, uh, and I understand why you have to have, sometimes they can save a lot of money because you have such specialized areas that they deal in all the time. But I believe you said that even if you saw where you could save some money, that you didn't have the positions that you could expand. And I, my question is, uh, what if, if you found some areas where you could save some money by expanding your positions, what does the General Assembly need to do to allow you to expand your positions? I guess raise that number up a little bit higher. So we set that number, the the, the it is, it is set, I think, at OPB. What? I think it is set at OPB. And it's approved during the annual yeah. appropriations, the same number. Mm -hmm. we, we do have latitude, though, within mm -hmm. our department in, in operating the department. If we need some, take some positions that, that we have, maybe they're vacant in a design area and we need them out in our environment location office, we can move, we've got the latitude to move some of our positions if we can get, if we can fill them. But uh, as Earl has said, a lot of times, just to be competitive, we cannot, uh, we can't be competitive with the outside consulting world. 
and uh, the cost, you know, you know, the the salaries that we pay, we could not be competitive. I understand that. I just but, wanted uh, to be, if if there were some areas where you saw you could be competitive, mm -hmm. I wanted to be sure that you were able, would be able to take advantage of that. Sure, we certainly would. One last thing, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm sure all of us in this room have to, from time to time, bring our county officials in to see the commissioner and uh, for roads and what have you. And it can be a very intimidating process. I came here in 1979, and I have served under some commissioners that made it more intimidating than they needed to. But I will say that our present commissioner, uh, even though he doesn't always give us what we need, is always very kind to our elected officials and very courteous and and uh, make them feel uh, at ease in your office. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Commissioner, I just wanted to uh, commend you for having one of the best road systems in the United States. And I, I've been able to travel a good many places and meet with other state officials. And, and they all, everybody brags on Georgia's roads, and I think you've know, done a good job. Just one question I wanted to ask. I, I heard uh, just a few days ago that the board, DOT board voted to realign the way the funds are going in congressional districts. And, and is that anything to, true to that? Is, is the... Uh the realignment or the uh, how money goes into the congressional yeah. districts. Right. You and your colleagues have done that. Our board, our board has no responsibility in that. What we do to take the projects to our board, we do a balancing ourselves, working with local governments, the MPOs, and working with local governments to establish their programs. We will then move projects into the program, but it's based on the balancing formula that you and your colleagues have already set up. The board just approves the adding of projects and the moving when they're ready, but it all has to be in line with the balancing bills that you folks have already addressed. Mr. I think that was most of my colleagues and not me. <laughs> 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 but I would like to say, with that, how will that affect the rural areas of Georgia? Well, all of the congressional districts are, are get. If I'm not mistaken, it's 80 percent of the, the available dollars, 80 percent of it now, is balanced out over the 13 congressional districts. Now, 20 percent of it is at the discretion of uh, addressing projects of need. Now, you know, that's, that's not just a lot of folks in the rural areas think, well, that's in the Atlanta area. And it's not. You're looking at bridges like uh, a bridge like down on the coast, the uh, uh, bridge down at Brunswick that was just done. You know, that bridge cost $128 million. Well, that uh, that project would never have gotten done, and that's not in the Atlanta area, but it would have never gotten done if you followed that 80% rule, not by doing doing that one and then anything else in that congressional district. So, But it, it it's a good bill. I think you folks have really addressed the need there because you have put 80% of it being split up equally amongst those congressional districts. Thank you, Commissioner, for that information. One last question. Yes, sir. I want to commend you for what the job you all do. It, it, we've got one of the best departments, I think, in the country. And the, your response to local needs, have, have really, I really appreciate that. And, and the reception they get, they're, they're impressed with it. And I've thought the same thing that uh, Representative Smith thought about hiring more staff. But looking at it, in some of those areas, aren't there these consultants have a niche that you just need, you don't need them all the time. If we went and hired more overhead, it's going to be more expensive than maybe use this guy for a one-time shot rather than hire him full time. That's right. And, and we've looked at that along with other, other DOTs around the country. When you hire somebody to do a specific project or you hire them to do a specific thing, well, do you need them after that uh, job is completed, and that's what a lot of folks are facing. And, and you're you're 100 percent correct. When that, I would rather have not not just you know, to, to answer your question. I think we could do it cheaper. I really do. That, that's the point. And, and I'm I just think concerned we how often you look to do that. Yeah, and we I, have, and I know you do a great yeah, job. Yeah, we have looked at that for years. I think we can. But what do we do with those folks when they get when we get through with them? You know, if if they're a consultant and they get through, I turn them loose. Any other questions? Commissioner, we're honored you're with us today. Oh, I appreciate, I appreciate the time. And Thank uh, you. Earl, good.
Thank you, sir. Thank you for the information. Okay. Uh, economic, if the hurting people want to leave, they're welcome to leave. Uh, don't feel like you have to stay. But economic development, Charlie, you want to come up and... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm Charlie Gatlin, the Chief of Staff for the Georgia Department of Economic Development. Commissioner Lesser was here, I think, yesterday morning and did our department budget uh, presentation, and uh, hopefully he's answered a lot of the questions for you as far as the department is concerned. I have one item I wanted to bring before the, the committee. Uh, you may recall last year um, the governor uh, had asked for uh, – the legislature to approve uh, $50 million, to authorize $50 million in the GO bond issue, which is in the current budget. And uh, we did that in anticipation of some, pro some major projects that we were going to have. Uh, the bad news is that we underestimated what our opportunities were going to be this year. Uh, and so we've got to come back uh, and ask for another GO bond issue. The governor wants to do that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've shared with you, and I know you have a, a sheet there that outlines these major projects. There are actually four projects on that list. Everybody should have a copy. Right. The $50 million uh, authorization that's already been done actually covers, as we are anticipating now, about two and a half of those four projects. And so we have a couple of other major projects that have come in that uh, – are going to need geo bond funding that we didn't know about back then, and so now we are faced with having to ask for more. And uh, again, in the amended budget, because the funds are going to be needed relatively quickly for these project for these other projects that have come up, we're going to have to uh, ask for. Uh, again, this is an upside estimate. Uh, it's a it's a number that's outside instead of conservative because we don't want to underestimate and then have to come back and ask you again. So this is an upside estimate of $75 million that would uh, provide funds for all four of these projects. The first one is already is a done deal, the Toyo Tire Plant, which is in Cartersville, Georgia. It is already constructed and in production. And uh, so that's a done deal. The others are the other... Three are in negotiations, I'll put it that way, and so they're not done deals yet. The state would acquire uh, these, uh, in the case of these projects, uh, basically the property, so it would be a capital asset that the state would own. And, uh, again, this is under negotiation, so these things are subject to change. Uh, but we think these projects will be uh, negotiated, and the negotiations will be completed in the next couple of months. So uh, we're going to have to have another authorization in order to do uh, what the governor would like to do and the commissioner would like to do with these projects, these major projects. So this is additional $75 million that you need? Yes. In yes. the supplemental 06. Any questions from anybody? Okay. Anybody? I notice that the fund you're talking about is needed in 2005, which is already passed. Is this uh, needed I, by May of 2005, March, July? June? Those those are typographical errors. It should March. be six. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> we are in six, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Calendar year. Good. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Yes, sir. I sort of appreciate it. Commissioner Urban expressed a few months ago, and I, I, I apologize, I was in an additional meeting at the time when you were here last, and we were talking about, and I don't know if the question came up, but the chairman can probably clarify this for me. Our, our National Guard, and Commissioner Urban had mentioned that he was willing to allow the National Guard to use a portion of the market bulletin so that the Guard member families could put stories in there talk about the Guard families. Has that issue came up for you? Have we made allowances in your budget for that, or are we just going to kind of rob a half a page here and there? I have not heard any mention of that. I would assume that that's something that we can incorporate into our resources as they currently are. But you don't intend to. But the mailing list not changing and the printing cost hopefully wouldn't change. Right. Okay. And that's my only question. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Before you run off, let me ask you. I'm sorry, I can't remember your name. I'm Sherry Forrest. Yeah, Sherry. Go back to the mic. Um, item 34 on the track, and replace 50 vehicles. I know uh, last year, you, did you get vehicles or not? I can't remember. No, sir. The last um, year we had funding for vehicles was fiscal year 2003. 2003? Yes, sir. How many vehicles y'all got in the department? We are authorized to have 295. Currently, we're operating with about 239. Okay. Think about half of them could limp until June the 30th. This is based on our projections for mileage, and as of June 30th, we're projecting this many to actually exceed 150,000 miles. Okay, these are the agents out in the fields? Yes, checking. sir, our field inspectors. Okay. Some of them are specialty vehicles that have special equipment that, you know, a, an inspector can't operate his personal vehicle um, because of equipment that has to be installed on the vehicle. Okay. Yeah. What are you... Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, these... A lot of these vehicles, do they stay here or stay at the office, the district office or wherever they are and they use their private vehicle and they, or do they take these vehicles home every night? No, well, the um, employees that are assigned vehicles are not located at an office. They are inspectors. They leave from home in the mornings, go directly to whatever facilities they are inspecting and then return home at night. So they do not operate out of an, out of an, out of an office except their home. So there's no commuting involved. Is there any kind of rule in the in the department saying that once your hours you're through, uh, those vehicles aren't to be used, or are they instructed, or, or do we know if they're used after hours for well, personal use? State policy is vehicles should be used only for state business, right. and they do have reports that they are required to fill out as far as where they travel to, the mileage, things like that. Okay. Thank you. And this is $40,000 per vehicle, correct? Approximately. Again, some of them are um, sedans, which would be less than that, but there are some trucks that are larger and would be upwards of seventy to $80,000. Anybody else? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank I you appreciate for being it. here. You're better looking than Commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I was uh, lost in New York last year. First time I'd ever been, you know, this is about far as north I've ever been. And I happened to be in a cab and I asked my sister. What's the, what's the number of miles before you get a new cab? I know it's not a scientific inquiry, but their response was, it's not even up for negotiation until it reaches 200,000. And that was idle chit-chat late at night, but I just thought that was kind of curious. And my, my boy's 97 Ford 150 still doing pretty good, you know, after, way after 135,000. I'd like to make a motion we cut this in half, sir. Okay. Motion. Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Number 12. Okay. Uh, Chairman, I, I, had, I used to be an assistant commissioner by the court a few years ago, and I do know that they have a lot of rough areas to go sometimes. And some, and some of the, the, I don't know of any commissioner that's been more conservative in making a dollar go farther than Tommy Irvin 
Uh, I know the fact that he, he was so conservative, sometimes he didn't pay his employees as much as they ought to be making. <laughs> and it's probably the reason I'm not still there. Uh, but but anyway, I would say that he has done an excellent job in, in um, trying to be conservative. And, and I, I really don't think he would ask for, for vehicles he didn't need. Right. I, I move that we uh, fund the, the recommended funding for the automobiles to the Department of Agriculture. Do I hear a second? Do I hear a second? No, motion fails. So we're back to the uh, 50. You want to repeat it again, Representative Reinders? And Okay. Now here's second. Okay. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Motion carries. And I think uh, Representative Reese has a concern. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the commissioner presented a request in addition to what was in the governor's recommendation for the uh, poultry lab located in Oakwood requesting a liquid handling system, a basic system, uh, maintenance and programming for $170,000. They have also provided us additional information that uh, there are other options that can be added for another $120,000 that would allow it to run 24-7 with uh, no staff in attendance. Uh, I would like to make the motion that we go ahead in the 06 budget and fund the basic handling system of $170,000 for the poultry lab. Okay. Got a motion. I hear a second. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed like sign? Okay. Did you say no, Representative Rinders? You did? Don't you have a poultry lab in Dalton? I thought you did. Got one opposed. Okay. What else we need to do, Ag? Anything? Anything else for that, Representative Reese? Okay. I think so, if I remember right. Wasn't that all that was needed at this time? That's on the trucking document now, right? Yeah, they asked for additional funds. They requested this in 07, but the governor moved it to 06 and didn't give them what they fully requested for it. Okay. Now, what were those amounts again? Um, the weight inspection, they'll need to take the 105, which is in the current trucking document, to 115. Okay. So it's 10000 And then the food safety inspection needs to go from 245 to 392 to 236. Okay. Any discussion on that? So all in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Yeah. You opposing? Aye. Okay. I need two. Two opposed. Okay. Motion carries. Okay. Community affairs. Uh, yeah, I didn't give community affairs didn't need to say anything, did we? Okay. Any comments on the community affairs? What's the favor flavor of the committee here? I got some money in there for uh, economic development. Yeah. I think everybody's for critical economic development projects. Okay. Got a motion to second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed like sign? Okay. <clears throat> and we got the the bond part of it. You want to go ahead and do the bond part of it? Isn't that Charlie on the amended? Yeah, it's got to be on the amended. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. Motion. Second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Like so. Okay. Forestry. Ken's still here too, so. There again, we're talking about 18 vehicles. Um, of course, I know it's all critical too. Do what? Yeah, we do. Representative Ray, you want to? I move that we pass it as recommended. Okay. Anybody? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Okay. Public Service Commission. I know uh, there's a uh, fuel case coming up between now and June the 30th, and uh, as mandated by law, we had to put some money in there to help them uh, for their third party. Witnesses, or is that correct? Okay. I think the amount was fifty thousand. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody any discussion about that? We don't have much choice in uh, funding that on these fuel cases. <coughs> how, about, how do we, tell, how do we determine the amount? Is, uh, they told me. That's what they need. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I got a motion. I hear a second. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed like so? Soil Water Conservation Commission. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carried. Travel expenses. That's right. They had that vehicle, didn't they? How many miles they got on it? It was a Ford Aerostar. No, it's two it was of them, wasn't it? Yeah. They had the Aerostar. Oh, international. What is that? Well, we. Well, you know, we got the bond package in there. I'd, I'd rather let the uh, Green Door deal with it myself if they want to do it. Okay. Yeah. We finished the soil water, right? Yeah. There was no additional anything, okay. Okay. Department of Transportation. Pretty complex. All in favor say aye. Uh, Any opposed like so? Okay. Motion uh, carries. Does that take care of everything now? Okay. Thank you all for being here. Sorry, it went a little over time. You going to do it now? <laughs>